Greetings, WAP Warriors. Brad Anderson here. Just going through a 1750 to 1900 review for the upcoming uh, test. Uh, the test will be at least this go around in 2021. It'll be on the AP College Board Classroom. It's going to be 30 MCQs, multiple choice questions, uh, varying in difficulty from you know fairly easy uh, rote memory, essentially knowledge on the content to application and analysis level questions. Uh, where your background knowledge is going to help, but you're going to ultimately have to you know, read a map uh, and answer a question or read an excerpt or look at an image. Um, very much what you will see on the actual AP exam on May 10th, which we have a date now uh, for that, and we know that we're going to be handwritten on location uh, in person. So uh, working towards that as well, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So uh, units uh, five and six, essentially, in the AP uh, College Board uh, content, and we're taking a look at uh, first today, uh, 1750 to 1900, we're gonna be taking a look first at the Atlantic Revolution. So let's take a look at the Atlantic Revolution. So the Atlantic Revolutions, uh, which corresponds to the textbook reading chapter eight. Um, so if you wanna go back and take a look, I I've, I've recommended to those who have asked that you take a look, there's usually a summary at the end of the chapter uh, that you can look at. There's guiding questions at the end. Obviously, you have your reading guide, you have your reading guide notes, you have the lecture notes, and I can always recommend uh, different cultural supplements that would be a good idea to take take a look at. You know, obviously, this is a great review, but it's always good to hear from an outside source. Um, so, you know, you're talking a crash course world history, and there's AP uh, uh, reviews online that are available, and I can steer you in that direction in person. But let's take a look. The Atlantic Revolutions were inspired by Enlightenment ideals and virtues. Uh, these Enlightenment ideals of you know, liberty and freedom and property and uh, inalienable rights are all going to inspire the likes of uh, you know America. Uh, the the British colonies in America are going to break free. Uh, after the Declaration of Independence, war breaks out, of course, and, and obviously if you want more more detail than just kind of the glossed over look, um, you can go back into some of these YouTube uh, videos and take a look at the battles and take a look at the historical figures. But uh, again, this is broad strokes, and, and the American Revolution, um, cemented by the Declaration of Independence, um, and then later won by the American uh, colonial forces, uh, which would become the United States. And the Articles of Confederation would serve for a very brief moment in time as the organizing document of a very loosely confederated United States. Uh, and that would, of course, give way to the uh, U.S. Constitution, um, which would include the Bill of Rights and a new form of government that would incl include a three-branch system of government, uh, the legislature, uh, the executive branch, and the judicial branch, and it would include elements that were inspired by the Enlightenment thinkers as well as uh, Roman and Greek history. Um, the French Revolution, which is uh, set off, uh, it's, it's a different sort of a revolution, um, much more civil turmoil. Not that there wasn't civil turmoil in the, in the American colonies, but the French countryside, French cities are torn apart. Uh, during this time period, obviously toppling the, the French royalty um, is, is all a part of this, uh, this, this, this revolution. And again, you can go back and look at all the nitty gritty details, but essentially the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man is the organizing document um, of the French Revolution. Uh, the French Revolution uh, becomes fairly, you know, fairly, very bloody uh, during what is known as the Reign of Terror. And Maximilien Robespierre, who is a leader during this time period, is going to send many people to the guillotine who are considered enemies of the state. He, in fact, becomes a, a, a victim himself of uh, this, this Reign of Terror and was, is, is one of the last um, people put to death by the guillotine during this Reign of Terror. The French Revolution is going to give way to the rise of Napoleon in the late 1700s, early, early 1800s. He is going to become a dictator for life and then later emperor. Uh, you're going to have the Napoleonic Wars and the Continental System. And of course, the Napoleonic Wars uh, end with uh, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. And he is uh, sent packing to the South Atlantic uh, and into exile. But the French Revolution is, is, is truly a time of considerable upheaval um, for the people of France. 
And the Haitian Revolution is a successful slave revolt led by Toussaint La Overture. And it is remarkable because the island was a sugar cane, uh, large sugarcane plantation style island and uh, the, the slaves revolt and push uh, the, the whites off of the, the island essentially. And Toussaint La Overture is the leader of this successful slave revolt. The Latin American revolutions are gonna go through uh, various uh, forms. You know, obviously there's South America, um, you have the, the Peninsulares, the Creoles, the uh, Mestizos, and Bolivar, and then the Mexican revolutions um, and the upheaval in, in Mexico uh, are, you know, you know different and, and, and unrelated in the sense that, you know, Mexico is a very different place than, say, Argentina, uh, but, but very similar efforts where you have the Creoles and the Mestizos who come together uh, to try to shed the bonds of Spanish rule or outside rule. Uh, but all, all in all, the Atlantic revolutions are going to provide freedom and at least independence for uh, these Western uh, countries or, you know, in the, in the sense of France, you know, there's going to be kind of this move forward, two steps forward, one step back for the next, uh, you know, several decades um, as they try to reach these Enlightenment ideals um, for their citizens. The Industrial Revolution, Chapter 9, I need to speed up here, um, starts in England. Uh, why does it start in England? We've gone over this many times. Stable banking system, iron and coal reserves, they have roads, canals, a stable government, um, and there is just a, it's the right place and right time for these, um, these, for these advancements to take place. You know, like Richard Arkwright's water frame, uh, the steam engine, um, you, you also have the locomotive. And so it starts in England, but it's going to spread to France, it's going to spread to Belgium, uh, the United States, and Russia. Um, in the United States, it's going to be very much an entrepreneurial effort. In Russia, it's going to be a top-down approach uh, on national uh, investment into uh, industrialization. There's rapid advancements in transportation, communication, food storage, and household conveniences. Again, you can look back on all those different things like the light bulb, uh, like the phonograph, um, the telegraph, the telephone, um, the refrigerated rail car are all good things to know and, and use if in uh, you know future LEQs or DVQs or SEQs. And then consequences of industrialization are going to be considerable. Uh, there's hazardous working conditions in the factories, long hours, uh, you know, six work, six day work weeks, there's pollution, rapid urbanization, and uh, you know, there's epidemics like the cholera epidemic, there's child labor, you know, small children going to work in factories and in mines, and then of course crime and alcoholism as a result of the, you know, kind of the breakdown of the family unit. So, you know, all all of this is considerable. Uh, you know, this industrial revolution is going to also be a cause for our next uh, topic, which is imperialism. Uh, you, in imperialism, it's the it's the scramble for Africa. We're talking about you know the Belgian Congo, um, which is this uh, you know Leopold II in Belgium uh, basically set up the Belgian Congo as like a as a plantation, a rubber plantation after the you know the advancement of vulcanization, where rubber can be used. Um, for rubber fittings and belts and for tires uh, in, in, in this rapid industrialization, uh, rubber is a lucrative commodity. And so the Belgians uh, are going to essentially, uh, through their poor treatment of the people of the Congo, commit mass genocide. 10 million people are going to die uh, in a very short period of time uh, because of this, this treatment. And at the Berlin Conference, the Berlin Conference, European powers meet without Africans to, co to basically divide up and show how to show gain and show control of African territory. Cecil Rhodes and his Cape to Cairo effort is a great example of that, wanting to build a uh, British railroad from um, Cairo in Egypt to the Cape in South Africa. Um, you know, Africa is rich in resources, and so it was an attractive uh, place. You have, you know, diamonds and rubber and oil and uh, salt and, and, and uh, tea and cotton and all, all these uh, commodities are going to be very attractive to European industrialists. And one thing I didn't put in here is, uh, is that, uh, or European imperialists, one thing that I didn't put in here is, is that in the 1880s, uh, Europeans had the means to imperialize. They had quinine, they had the maximum machine gun. Um, they were, they had the steam uh, ships able to go up these vast rivers into the interior and heart of Africa. They have the steam locomotive. And so it wasn't so much that Europeans didn't want to imperialize or, or get involved in Africa up to this point, but they now had a means to do so. So Europeans carve up the continents uh, into colonies, protectorates, spheres of influence. Ethiopia remains free, um, and that's a great story, the Battle of Vodawa and Menelik II and how they fight back against the Italians in order to remain free when their African neighbors are largely 
um, overtaken by Europeans. British India, um, the Sepoy Mutiny, otherwise known as the Indian Rebellion of 1857-1858, leads to a British rule of India, and uh, India is a British uh, part of the British Empire until 1947. Um, and is considered the jewel in the crown of the British Empire because of its tea and its cotton and other uh, resources that are extracted. Um, you have the Pacific Islands, New Zealand and Australia, again, colonized um, uh, territories by the British Empire. And the, the, the saying goes, you know, that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And so, you know, there's, there's this um, you know, mistreatment of, of, of native peoples. There is forced assimilation. There is a destructive of traditional ways of life. And you know, converge forced conversion or kind of a you know no choice conversion to um, to Christianity uh, that happens during this time period. Obviously, advancements in medicine and uh, you know the positives are uh, native peoples have um, modern technology, but uh, you know you, you could very well argue that the the negatives of imperialism on uh, the uh, native populations is very much going to outweigh any positives that come as a result of European imperialism. The justification for imperialism can be found and rooted in social Darwinism, the application of the biological theory of adaptation, uh, but more or less it is the, you know, the strong should rule the weak and that, uh, you know, the survival of the fittest uh, came to be a clarion call of imperialists and industrialists who wanted to extract resources and subjugate peoples. Also the idea of the civilizing mission that it was, uh, you know, European uh, Christian Europeans' duty to civilize the heathens, and uh, this was very much a prevalent justifying thought, as well as scientific racism, the belief that uh, Europeans were, you know, somehow racially superior um, to, to other cultures, um, which was, you know, obviously it's unscientific, in fact, I almost put that in parentheses, unscientific racism uh, when, when developing this theory of justification for uh, imperialist attitudes and actions. And then finally, We'll close here with uh, Empires in Collision. Um, Empires in Collision, Chapter 11, basically covers the, you know, the period of crises for China, China's century of crises, um, uh, the opium wars and opium addiction that is widespread, and China's fight to try to rid the countryside uh, of uh, the opium trade, the British Empire being the main purveyors of opium into the into the country, uh, which which fails, and then they are forced to to sign a series of unequal treaties. Um, which basically strips China of, of, of you know much, including its pride, its economic independence, um, and you know it's now kind of controlled from an outside power. The Taiping Rebellion is this moment. Uh, uh, you know, it's one of the most deadliest civil wars in history, and the Taiping Rebellion almost results in a toppling of the Qing Dynasty, but rather it it, it is crushed because of the provincial leaders, and it ends in um, you know a weakening of the Chi of the Qing Dynasty. The Boxer Uprising, another attempt at kind of ridding the country of Western imperial um, influence. The Chinese Revolution of 1911 and 1912 is very much a revolution, uh, you know, focused on modernization, industrialization, and trying to you know rid China of the uh, Qing Dynasty and you know kind of advance into the 20th century. Um, and China was not done yet. The, the, the 20th century was going to be a century of upheaval as well. Um, but uh, again, China would regain its seat at the proverbial uh, boardroom table of European powers by the end of the 20th century, and we'll get there after spring break. The Qing dynasty ends, and you know, a mo modernization, uh, rapid industrialization, um, you know, is, it becomes a focus of the nationalist forces that are going to rule over China. Then you have the Ottoman Empire, the Tanzimat reforms. Uh, are going to attempt to bring um, the Ottoman Empire up to speed with the West. The, with the West, you have the Young Ottomans, a group that tries to, you know, bring uh, the Ottoman Empire into the modern era, and then the Young Turks and nationalism, which are going to focus on a secular um, Turkey after World War One and a, a um, uh, you know modern education system. In, in, in rapid industrialization, I keep saying that, but you know, railroads and factories that are going to bring uh, the Ottoman Turkish Empire up to speed. And then finally, and I've got about 45 seconds, the rise of Japan, which we just went over. You have the Tokugawa shogunate, which rules a, a fragmented Japan from 1600 to 1868. But Commodore Perry is going to disrupt that party uh, in his visit in, in the 1850s in Edo Bay. The Meiji Restoration in 1866, 1868 is going to begin, again, an effort of modernization, militarization, industrialization, and Japan is going to catch up to the rest of the world, essentially, and their victory in the Russo-Japanese War is going to be the hallmark of their arrival at the boardroom table of European powers in 1905. 
Uh, good luck on the test. It is multiple choice questions. Make sure you look over your notes and uh, good luck. Huzzah.